Hello. Up until this point in the course, we've completely ignored any resistive forces whatsoever. We've talked about situations as if air resistance did not exist. But in real life, obviously, it does exist. So this video is all about drag and where it is, uh, where we need to talk about it and where we need to quantify it. OK, so we're going to talk about the following points. Where is drag important? In which situations does the drag force act in such a way that we need to take it into account? Um, what does it depend on? So if drag is acting on an object, what factors will, um, will it depend on? Can we get an equation that quantifies drag? And we're going to look at some various situations where we need to maximize drag or where we need to minimize drag in various um, devices and vehicles and things like that. And then we're going to look at terminal velocity and we're going to see if we can draw velocity time graphs and force time graphs showing how forces change with time and change with speed when an object is falling or moving through fluids. OK, so let's get going. OK, so this slide shows you the various factors that drag force depends on. Now, the, the top two are the most important, probably. So we're talking about the object here. We're talking about the velocity of the object. So how fast the object is actually traveling through the fluid. The cross-sectional area um, of the object. By cross-sectional area, I mean the area normal to the, the, the direction that it's traveling. So if it's traveling in the direction of this arrow here, the normal, the cross-sectional area, will be the area perpendicular to the direction of travel. So if the object is this sort of shape, like a car, for example, or a train, and it's traveling this way, obviously we need to figure out what that area there, the cross-sectional area is that's at right angles to the direction of motion. So that's the velocity and the cross-sectional area. The drag force also depends on how dense the fluid is. Obviously more dense fluids, like liquids for example, are going to have much more of a drag effect on objects than gases such as air. Um, these two can be kind of grouped together. The aerodynamics of the object, so effectively how streamlined the object is, and what the surface is made from. How the surface uh, responds to the air and how it, um, it affects the airflow as the, uh, as the object flows, sorry, moves through the fluid. So there's five factors there. And in actual fact, the drag force will increase when any or all of these factors mentioned increase. OK, so all of these are um, have a sort of positive correlation, if you like, to the drag force itself. OK, so let's try and quantify that. But before we do, we need to say that we can group all of these together. When you start getting into the area of aerodynamics, it becomes quite complex and it's way beyond the, uh, the A-level syllabus. So we're going to group all these and say for a particular object moving through a particular fluid, these three are all constants. And we're going to combine them into a single constant K. And once we've done that, we, just, we can just see that the drag force depends on the velocity and the cross-sectional area, as well as all these objects that we're going to keep constant. So when you put that into an equation, you have this. Um, the drag force itself is equal to this constant that we've uh, made out of the three um, complex but reasonably constant um, quantities multiplied by the cross-sectional area multiplied by the square of the velocity and this is really important so the drag force turns out to be proportional to the square of the velocity so if you double the velocity you're going to have a factor of two squared um, added on and therefore the drag force is going to increase by, increase by a factor of four when the velocity doubles. The area is a bit more straightforward because the drag force is proportional to the surface area. So if you double the surface area you're going to double the drag force and obviously remember that's the cross-sectional area normal to the direction of travel. Okay so we'll be using this equation in class to try and figure out uh, drag forces on certain objects at different speeds. But that's the guiding equation for our drag forces. All right, so there are various situations where drag is a problem. And this is where we need to start streamlining objects. And here are four examples of objects that are designed to move with maximal speed or maximal efficiency through the air. And so we need to bring the drag forces down um, as much as possible. So we've got the, uh, the shape of the hull of this speedboat is, is uh, fluted and is, is a quite a complicated shape. 
um, in order to make sure that the drag force is minimized. Here we have a swimmer in one of those um, shark suits that are now banned in international competitions, um, which is purely designed to decrease the drag forces on the swimmer and to get him to glide as fast and efficiently through the water as possible. This is um, a time trial or a triathlon bike, and you can see that every single element of this bike has been designed with drag in mind. Um, from the frame where we've got these complex shapes here to the wheels which have deep rims or possibly an entire solid disc, the uh, handlebars and the aero position, even the saddle post is aerodynamic. So this bike has been designed to minimize the drag forces that are on it by changing the aerodynamic shape of the object. And this down here is a first generation Toyota Prius, which when it was released was the most aerodynamic car in its class. So there we have uh, various situations, mainly to do with streamlining uh, and the quality of the surface, particularly in, this, in the shape of the swimsuit, because obviously you can't do much about the shape of the swimmer's body, but you, what you can do um, is change the surface so that you get a little turbulent layer just uh, over the um, surface, which enables you to slip through the water with minimal drag. So there are other situations where we need to maximize drag and these are usually to do with controlling speed or slowing down, getting maximum deceleration out of an object. Um, all of these, apart from the skydiver, are very, very similar and involve braking. Here we've got the space shuttle, uh, which has a parachute to slow it down once it lands. So you're maximizing the drag by increasing the surface area of, of the object there. In this situation, this is a Bugatti Veyron. On the top of the Bugatti Veyron, it has this brake here. Now this brake lifts into a vertical position when you press down hard on the brake pedal. Um, and at top speed, that vertical air brake can actually provide as much braking force as the brakes on a normal car. So that increases the drag force, increases the braking force quite dramatically at high speed on that particular sports car. Here we see some uh, a width, the wing of a, a passenger jet and you, can, you may have noticed actually that when it lands, these uh, flaps will flip up into a near vertical position on the wings, providing an increase in surface area in order to slow the object down. Um, and that, that's um, an airplane's version of this, which is um, an air brake. And here we see a skydiver who is controlling his velocity by going into a spread eagle position. So this increases his surface area again and enables him to slow down. So it's all about the aerodynamics of the object and the increase in the surface area in order to change drag forces, make them as maximal or as minimal as possible. Okay, 